Physical weathering is the relentless breakdown of rock mechanically. The busting, the cracking, the destruction of the rock physically. There are a couple things that determine how a rock breaks during this process. A rock can have natural zones of weakness that are related to bedding planes or structural forces, as we'll see in a minute. It can be related to the activity of organisms. Animals chew on rocks. Animals dig at rocks. Plants wedge rocks open. Root hairs get into tiny mineral dissolution zones in rocks and expand. Water can get into rocks. That ice is going to freeze and expand, cracking the rock. And a rock can exfoliate. It peels away as pressure is reduced. So here we have a classic photo of the combination of physical weathering and chemical weathering. We have joint sets in rocks that are induced by pressure regimes. This is going to force these joint sets ultimately to be expressed when the rock begins to weather. Now we were driving around in the uh, the giant fern forests of Tasmania one week and finally got out of that. Heading along the, uh, the shoreline, we looked out the window and I noticed this strange pavement. And I thought, that's some really strange pavement. So we got closer and noted that it's real. So this is natural. These are joint sets that are introduced into sedimentary rock that are now being weathered chemically and physically. In some instances, like in this image here, it looks like you can just literally take these blocks out and build something out of it. A wall, a castle, a fortress, and I think that was actually done. And um, that's why they're removed in this fashion here. You don't see any loose blocks lying out here. Physical weathering can also result from frost wedging. In this case, water trickles down into a fracture. Might be a tiny fracture in the rock here near the surface. And as that water transitions from the liquid phase to the solid, from water to ice, it expands by just a little over 9%. That 9% expansion is enough to eventually peel the rock apart. And that 9% expansion in the crack here is also representative of the part of an iceberg that you see floating. The part of the iceberg that sticks up above the water is about 9% of the total volume. So that gives you a clue as to how big the iceberg really is. And here we have another famous image of exfoliation. This is Half Dome in Yosemite. And what we see here is granite peeling away like layers of an onion. And what's happening is this rock solidified at a significant depth under great pressure. And once that pressure was released, the rock begins to expand. So it's coming into equilibrium with the lower pressures observed at the Earth's surface compared to down deep below where the Sierra Nevada mountains are today. Soils represent the remains of rock. It's the residue, the residuals of weathering. We can consider them to be geosystems in that they have a lot of interacting components that are related to the Earth. So these geosystems include input material, transformations and translocations, the addition and removal of material, and the output material. What goes into a soil geosystem is not the same as what comes out of a soil geosystem. Here we have a, an image of the basic soil forming processes. Illustrated here are losses, again, transformations. We're removing the material. It can blow away. It can wash away. Something could pick it up and carry it away. And we have additions, which are also known as translocations. This is material that can, again, be blown in. It can be provided by plants. It can wash in an addition to the system. Something new has been added. We're not going to discuss soil types in any kind of detail, so you don't need to memorize the, the names of the soil types or the definitions of the soil types. Just be aware that different soils form from different starting materials under different environmental conditions. So we can characterize an environment in the past, perhaps, by looking at an ancient soil that's been converted into a sedimentary rock. These ancient soils, which are called paleosols, also contain a lot of information that can provide details of how the environment changes over time. This can include climate history. We can measure stable isotope values in a sediment pile and determine 
from those changing isotope values how the environment, how the climate changed over that period of time. We can look at questions of how the atmosphere has changed over time. Here, in this diagram, we see carbon isotope values ranging from around minus 14-ish to plus 4-ish over here or so. And you'll notice there's a change about 8 to 6 million years ago where the carbon isotope values became much higher. And this coincides with a change in the type of grasses that were growing in prairie type environments around the world. That has been suggested to be related to a change in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, as a result of the change in grass types, we see a change in the crown height of horse teeth. As horses eat different types of grasses, their teeth evolve. So a change in atmospheric CO2 might have resulted in a change in the tooth height, the crown height, in horses, which resulted in the evolution of horses. Well, that's kind of cool. And lastly, paleosols can provide us with a history of erosion. The type of material and the amount of material tells us about how that material got there and where it came from. The formation of stream valleys results from three principal processes that serve to erode bedrock and mountains. The first is abrasion of bedrock by suspended and saltating sediment. This is sediment that's either gliding above the stream bed or it's material that's bouncing along the stream bed. And as it's bouncing along the stream bed, it's knocking little bits and pieces off of material that lies below it and material that it's bumping into in the saltation process. It can occur by the plucking of rock fragments from the channel. These rocks can be small plucked up by the current itself, or they can be quite large. They can be the size of a car or even a house if picked up by ice. And this brings us to glacial erosion at high elevations. This can be a high elevation at low latitude or a low elevation at high latitude. Either way, it's cold year round. These glaciers are going to grind rocks against one another, like sandpaper. They're also going to bang rocks against one another like a jackhammer. Taking a look at it graphically, here we see the scale of erosion, where increasing sediment size, sediment volume, and bedrock hardness increase the resistance to erosion. So the larger the grain, the harder it is to move. The more material there is, the harder it is to move, that larger amount of material. And the bedrock hardness, the resistance to abrasion, erosion, or plucking. It's going to lead to increased resistance to erosion itself. Now, stream power on the other side of this balance is related to increasing slope and stream discharge. We steepen the stream, we increase its gradient, and we might also increase the volume, the amount of water and or ice that's flowing through a valley. So ultimately, one of these is going to tip the scale. More water, Steeper slope, more stream power. Less water, shallow slope, more resisting power. So in steep wet terrains, stream power is going to overcome resistance to erosion. Sediment particles are going to be transported away and bedrock hardness becomes the principal factor in resistance to erosion. So here, Yellowstone Park, we have a steep gradient. There's a big waterfall just out of the picture here. The lower falls, which is 308 feet. And then the upper falls a little further upstream around, I think, 109 feet or so. So those are precipitous drops. But in between, we have a fairly steep gradient that you can see in the form of rapids here. This rock is rhyolite. It's somewhat loosely consolidated, so it's easily weathered. In this case, resisting power is weak, and the stream power is strong with this one. Where slopes are more gentle, stream discharge is lower, the stream power is going to be lower. And in this case, sediment begins to be deposited as these streams meander through the valley. Ultimately, the stream bed is going to be coated with enough heavy material that it's protected from further erosion, further vertical decay. Given this scenario, at this point, stream power and resistance to erosion are going to be in balance. Now, where the slopes are much lower, stream power is also much lower because of this lower gradient, and sediment is going to be deposited 
such that the stream bed builds up and fills the valley with sediment. So now you have a hopelessly meandering stream on a relatively flat floored valley. And this is the way it will remain until all the highlands have worn down. The factors that influence weathering erosion include the duration of weathering. We mentioned this before, the longer the weathering process proceeds, the more weathering is going to occur. That's pretty straightforward. Limited weathering time results in limited weathering. The mineral composition of the parent rock is going to be important. If the minerals are very stable, like quartz, the weathering is going to be minimal. If the rocks are easily weathered, the minerals are easily weathered, such as the case of feldspar, which weathers chemically and physically, there's going to be potentially more weathering. Temperature. Again, we mentioned this before. The higher the temperature, the more rapid the chemical weathering. The lower the temperature, the greater the significance of physical weathering. Also, when you're right around the freezing point, rising above freezing and going below freezing daily, that results in significantly more physical weathering. So if you're in a perpetually cold environment, there's not going to be much weathering. If you're in a perpetually warm environment, there won't be much physical weathering, but there'll be significant chemical weathering. And this brings us to the amount of rainfall that's going to come into play with chemical weathering as well. The more rain, the more physical and chemical weathering can occur. Stream power is going to be increased by additional rainfall. And also the erosive nature of chemicals in that water, in that rainfall, the acid rain, is going to lead to increased dissolution of minerals. If rainfall is minimal or non-existent, as in the case in some deserts in the world, there's going to be very insignificant chemical weathering. And very small amounts of physical weathering too, perhaps. Rainfall acidity, which is forced in part by our contribution of CO2 to the atmosphere, is such that the more acidic the rainfall, the greater the chemical weathering of any susceptible minerals. The higher the pH of rainfall, the lower the amount of chemical weathering. Topography, more erosion and less chemical weathering in places of high topography, high elevation changes, you're not going to have the time to chemically weather the material. It's going to be washed or ground up and pushed away. In places with low topography, there's going to be very limited erosion, and chemical weathering is going to be much more significant. Which brings us to mass wasting. This is something happening quickly, very rapidly. It's very impressive. Mass wasting includes all processes by which masses of rock and soil move down slope. Mass movement occurs when the force of gravity exceeds the strength of the material and it moves down slope. Again, this can occur very quickly. Here we have an example from California, Montecito, where a mudslide buried part of the town. Now, the primary factors related to mass wasting include the nature of slope materials, including the angle of repose. How steep can you pile up this material before it collapses? The amount of water. More water generally provides lubricant and spacing between grains, and this is going to result in much greater mass wasting potential. And of course, the steepness of the slope and the stability of that slope are going to be major either proponents or deterrents of mass wasting. A steep slope with low stability is very likely to collapse. This is something you would hope your contractor would realize if you're building a home in a mountainous region, that that slope is unstable. We're not going to build there. Or it's a great slope. What have you? Let's go for it. It could be a disaster. Three primary factors that influence the propensity for mass wasting include the nature of slope materials and how they're stacked up. Are they close to the angle of repose, the, the maximum steepness that you could pile them without them moving? The amount of water is going to be important in that it either lubricates the particles or it causes them to adhere, to stick together. And perhaps most obviously, the steepness and stability of the slope that lies beneath the material that is subject to mass wasting. When we look at sand as an example of unconsolidated material, we can pile up fine-grained sand to an angle of repose of about 35 degrees. So dropping out of an hourglass, this is the steepness of the cone of material that lies beneath that. Coarser sand can be stacked at a higher angle, 
and then very angular pebbles can be stacked at an even higher angle than that, 45 degree angle. So this would be a difficult climb. Actually, all of these would be difficult climbs because you're right at the angle of repose, which means every step up you take, you're going to slide back a little bit. Now let's add some water to this mix. The water molecules between the grains have a characteristic that either allows the grains to stick material together or it allows them to push grains apart. In relatively small amounts, damp sand for instance, the dampness is going to bind the particles so that they resist movement. They tend to stick together and they can stick together at a much, much higher angle of repose. It's now artificial because of this adhesion factor that's been added. Dry sand is going to collapse into its standard angle of repose, maybe 40 degrees as we see up here. And it's because these particles are bound only by their size and friction with each other, where they touch these boundaries. Now, if we flood the sand with water and we saturate it, these saturated particles are gonna be separated by water. This is going to act as a lubricant, keeping them apart and reducing the friction between them. The net result is the sand is going to collapse into a blob. Water-saturated sand tends to flatten out. Now again, this water can provide either lubrication to increase the likelihood that, the, that mass wasting is going to occur, or in extreme cases, it can actually lead to a kind of liquefaction, which we call liquefaction of the sediment. Solid materials, solid sand and silt and clay mixed with gravel and sometimes boulders can act like a thick, viscous fluid. And that's problematic if you have a building on top of a thick, viscous fluid or a road. Taking it to extremes in adhesion terms, here we have a sand sculpture. I don't think this won the contest, but it serves a purpose. So here we have extreme adhesion. The people that built this know the maximum amount of adhesion you can get from adding water to dry sand to produce these intricate shapes and crazy angles of repose. Now in the natural world, rather than the supernatural world of sand sculpture, we have to consider the angle of slope, the accumulation of rubble, how much material is there, how stable is it on that slope, and whether this material is going to break into large blocks. So here we have two examples some thinly bedded sedimentary rock that's breaking down shallow slope. It's going to accumulate right at the front of that slope. In this instance, this is probably a granitic rock that's exfoliating. As it exfoliates, it peels away again like layers of an onion. Those slabs are going to break apart and produce what we call a talus slope. This talus slope is at the angle of repose, meaning this person would do a lot of slipping and sliding as they tried to climb up this slope. What causes mass wasting? There has to be some kind of trigger. You exceed some dimension of stability and it literally falls apart. We have a mass wasting event. This can be initiated by earthquakes. We actually shake up that material that's sitting at an angle of repose. It's ready to go. It just takes a little push and it's gone down slope. We can add rainfall and we could pump water in from below. And this is going to tend to, again, separate the particles, lubricate the particles. And the result is we eventually overload the material and it goes sliding down slope in a mass wasting event. We can break these up into landslides that are triggered by earthquakes. This is an example from the Good Friday earthquake of 1964 in Alaska. This event sort of brings all of the bad characteristics, the mass wasting propensities together in one event. So we have some loose material, sand and gravel, sitting on top of clay, which is impermeable to water passing through it vertically. Beneath that, we have a water-saturated sandy layer. So what happens is when we shake this up, this water-saturated sandy layer provides sort of a greased layer, like a greased pig, as some might say. And the destabilization above related to this smooth, slippery, slimy layer results in the material breaking up, slumping. And this 
slumping, if buildings or roadways are on top of it, destroys those buildings and roadways. The integrity of the earth has been impinged upon. The characteristics used to determine the classification of mass movements include the nature of the rock, whether it's consolidated, it's still rock, or it's unconsolidated, it's broken up. The velocity of movement can be slow, almost imperceptible, called creep, or it can be moderate, a slumping, or fast. In this case, it could be hundreds of miles an hour, or hundreds of kilometers an hour. And the nature of the movement, whether it's a flow, a slide, or a fall, that's going to be related to angles and gravity.